Welcome to Navarra Live. I'm Michael Walker. I'm joined by Dahlia Gabriel. Dahlia, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Sorry, I was just fixing my hair there and the, that you caught me in the dregs of doing that. Uh, I'm doing good. My first day in, in like this year, I think, wearing a sleeveless top. So much to celebrate. <laughs> Gorgeous. And you look fabulous in it. I just bought some vests today. I'm going away for a week to Italy. I will not be hosting Navarra Live um, until next Friday. So I'm pretty excited, but you're going to be in very safe hands while I'm gone. Um, on tonight's show, we will be discussing this latest statement from Southwest or South Wales police, sorry. I think we're still, it doesn't seem to me that we're getting the full picture there. Um, very, very interesting. We're also going to be talking about the EHRC, lots of disquiet um, in the Equalities Commission and a millionaire um, trying to fight aging via the means of his son's blood. Uh, very strange. You might have seen this on social media. It's very interesting. Before we get going, a quick correction. Last night, we called the activists protesting Shell's AGM um, Fossil Free Freedom. They are, in fact, Fossil Free London. Um, so just to correct that. The Boris Johnson show goes on, and that's because, once again, he's been referred to the police for allegedly breaking lockdown rules. Some of these alleged breaches are supposed to have taken place at Chequers, the Prime Minister's country residence. The Times reports this. The Cabinet Office has passed concerns to the Metropolitan Police and Thames Valley Police after several visits to the Prime Minister's grace and favour residence, as well as new allegations about his behaviour in Downing Street, were highlighted during preparations for a public inquiry into the pandemic. The Privileges Committee, which is investigating claims that Johnson misled Parliament over lockdown-breaking parties, has been informed. Johnson was made aware of the concerns last week and has since written to the Cabinet Office denying rule breaking. As you'll know, we've had lots of investigations into Boris Johnson so far. Why then um, has this come out now? How did the Cabinet Office get hold of this particular information? Well, um, that's where the story gets marginally more interesting. Johnson has been relying on government lawyers to represent him in the forthcoming COVID inquiry. And as part of his evidence, he passed his diaries to them. However, because the lawyers are government lawyers, their client isn't Boris Johnson, but the Cabinet Office. And so they passed the diaries on to civil servants. That's when officials in the Cabinet Office discovered that between June 2020 and May 2021, Johnson hosted family and friends at Chequers. Um, so he, he wanted taxpayer funded lawyers, and that seems to have bitten him in the ass already. Um, a spokesperson for the Cabinet Office said this information came to light during the process of preparing evidence for submission to the COVID inquiry. It was identified as part of the normal disclosure review of potentially relevant documents being undertaken by the legal team for inquiry witnesses. In line with obligations in the Civil Service Code, this material has been passed to the relevant authorities, and it is now a matter for them. So that's the Cabinet Office spokesperson. Johnson is reported to be furious at the latest police involvement. So his spokesperson said this, the assertion by the Cabinet Office that there have been further COVID rule breaches is totally untrue. Lawyers have examined the events in question and advised that they were lawful. No contact was made with Mr. Johnson before these incorrect allegations were made both to the police and to the Privileges Committee. This is both bizarre and unacceptable. For whatever political purpose, it is a plain that this is a last ditch attempt which is being made to lengthen the Privileges Committee investigation as it was coming to a conclusion and to undermine Mr. Johnson. He's not happy. Um, and it's not just Boris Johnson who's furious. His allies are too. They're losing it over what they see as a government stitch up, even threatening to damage Sunak's authority in revenge for the new allegations or this new blow up of the story. Now, according to The Telegraph, Boris Johnson's allies are threatening to trigger by-elections over new COVID rule breaking row um, as a means to damage him. And the Telegraph write this, given the Conservatives are more than 10 percentage points behind Labour in the nationwide opinion polls, Mr Sunak would face a challenge to win all three by-elections. A Johnson ally told the Telegraph, if it transpires that the government has tried to report Boris Johnson to the police for entirely lawful activity just for political purposes, then I'd expect free by-elections to take place and by-election defeats would cause political damage to Mr Sunak. Um, the three MPs in question are Alok Sharma, Nigel Adams and our old friend Nadine Dorries. Um, another Arch Johnson ally, Jacob Rees-Mogg, had this reaction. Today's news shows that there are some people who will never rest until they have hounded Boris further and further. The latest stories are just another example of how those who 
don't like Boris, mainly because of Brexit, are always looking for something to have a go at him on. It is a supreme non-story. I can tell you that during that period, I went to Chequers. I was invited there with my children, entirely in accordance with the rules. Johnson has since sacked the government lawyers who've been helping him prepare for the COVID inquiry, saying that he's, quote, currently unrepresented. That inquiry is due to begin next month. But it's a bad time for Johnson to be without lawyers. That's because Baroness Hallett, chair of the inquiry, has just ordered the Cabinet Office to release his unredacted WhatsApp messages and diaries from the pandemic years. She made the order after the Cabinet Office refused to give her access to all the materials, arguing they were, quote, irrelevant. The Times reports this. Hallett, a retired Court of Appeal judge, is demanding access to group chats related to the coronavirus and personal messages sent by Johnson and Cook to 40 people, including Rishi Sunak. Johnson's messages to and from Michael Gove, Liz Truss, Matt Hancock, Chris Whitty, Patrick Valance, Dominic Cummings, Simon Case, Steve Barclay, Sajid Javid, Dominic Raab and Kemi Badenoch are also being specifically demanded by Hallett, so that would be pretty interesting. Um, she also wants to read unredacted diaries for Johnson between January the 1st, 2020 and February 24th, 2022, when he ended COVID restrictions, as well as 24 notebooks where Johnson made contemporaneous notes during his time in Downing Street. She has warned the Cabinet Office that failure to hand over the documents is a criminal offence, punishable on summary conviction with a fine not exceeding £1,000 and or imprisonment for a maximum of 51 weeks. A couple of questions for you, Dahlia. I suppose, you know, Jacob Rees-Mogg thinks this is a non-story. I'm kind of looking at this and thinking it's kind of surprising that you could demand someone's unredacted diaries. You know, especially, if, you know, this isn't a, the criminal investigation, the COVID inquiry is a, you know, it's a question with a lot of you know, legal backing behind it and some very significant questions to be answered. But what if he was just, you know, talking about people he fancied that weren't his wife? What strikes me here is just the deep hypocrisy. You know, if this was a black teenager from Lewisham, I'm sure that Jacob Rees-Mogg, whatever that, person would have been accused of doing, Jacob Rees-Mogg would not be calling for leniency. He would not be calling it a witch hunt. He would be calling for, you know, relentless and endless punishment. And that's what's so frustrating about the way that allies of Johnson and the Conservatives more broadly believe in law and order as a means of disciplining everyone else except themselves. Uh, It strikes me that for them, this is entirely a story about whether or not Rishi Sunak is trying to take an axe to Boris Johnson's already pretty butchered reputation, rather than trying to get to the actual truth of what might have happened here. You know, it is in the public interest to know if the Prime Minister was inviting friends and families to checkers during the COVID lockdown, especially if, as he has sometimes indicated he or his allies are trying to get him to rerun at some point for conservative leadership. People have a right to know if, unfortunately, we are all made to potentially have to vote for him again, not we, but as in the elect, if he's put to the electorate again, the electorate deserve to know exactly what went down when he was prime minister. Obviously, it's deeply unclear as to whether or not Boris Johnson ever has a shot of running for prime minister again, if he ever wants to. Uh, You know, towards the end of last year, there was sort of an indication that he might be trying to challenge Rishi Sunak, or at least make a punt for conservative leader after Liz Truss um, spectacularly failed. And there was lots of indications that amongst the conservatives, he would be far more popular than Rishi Sunak. But then he sort of pulled back on that and said, no, I'm not I'm not going to run for leader. Um, I'm counting myself out. But clearly there is some there's a little bit of a will he won't he um, dynamic there. And so it might be the case that Rishi Sunak is trying to make sure that that challenge to his leadership can't happen. But that doesn't change the fact that we deserve to know exactly the extent of potential rule breaking that took place when this country was under lockdown. So complete hypocrisy from Boris Johnson and from the, um, you know, his allies to be expected. Uh, They see law and order as something for the plebs to have to be subjected to, not for themselves. And when it's applied to them, it's a witch hunt, which is obviously um, very interesting. But for me, what actually really captured my attention here and what I found even more galling than the hypocrisy that was on stage with, with Jacob Rees-Mogg is the fact that Boris Johnson has been essentially receiving legal aid in order to fight this case. You know, he's been, because his lawyers have been cabinet office lawyers, 
250 grand of essentially legal aid has been given to Boris Johnson in order to fight this case. Just to just to remind people watching at home, since the Conservatives have attacked legal aid, basically no one can access it unless they earn less than £12,750, I think, a year. So that event is essentially shuts out the vast majority of people from adequate legal representation. It has been a complete indictment of our justice system. It's made our justice system essentially a two-tiered system, one for the rich who can afford lawyers and non-existent for everyone else, right? And yet in the middle of that, Boris Johnson, who is raking in six figures with speaking gigs around the world on top of his MP salary, is being given £250,000 of essentially legal aid in order to fight this case. And it just goes to show that the Conservatives love to preach this doctrine of self-reliance, of individualism, of, you know, no handouts. And yet they are willing to take each and every handout that is available to them, even when it is highly inappropriate to do so, and they don't even need it. So to me, this was just a perfect encapsulation of the two Britons that we are living in right now. You know, the Britain for the rich and the Jacob rees Moltz and the Boris Johnsons and the Britain for the rest of us. Earlier this week, Two teenage boys were killed in a road collision in the Cardiff suburb of Ely. Um, Kyrie Sullivan, 16, and Harvey Evans, 15, were riding an electric bike when the accident occurred on Monday. Following the deaths, riots erupted in their community. There was huge disruption with between 100 and 150 people taking part. Cars were set alight and the police were pelted with fireworks. Now, what we were first told after those events was that riots had been caused by a false rumour that police had been chasing the boys in a van. That story changed after this CCTV footage emerged. It showed the two boys being pursued on their bike by a police van. Since then, South Wales police have referred themselves to the Independent Office for Police Complaints, and South Wales Police Deputy Chief Constable Rachel Bacon gave this reconstruction of events to the media. We have been busy obtaining witness accounts analysing tracking data from police vehicles and studying CCTV. And this is what we know now. 1759.40, CCTV shows the bike travelling towards the police vehicle in Frank Road. The bike then turns around. 18.00.52, the bike is followed by the police vehicle, which you have already seen on CCTV images. Neither blue lights or sirens were in use. 1801.18, police vehicle is at New Ely Church Roundabout and travels through Archer Road, Stanway Road and Howell Road. 1802.31, police vehicle turns onto Grand Avenue. 1802.18 to 1802.41, this is the approximate time of the road traffic collision on Snowdon Road. At the time of the collision, the police vehicle is in Grand Avenue, half a mile away from Snowdon Road. 1806.59, the police vehicle is on Cowbridge Road West when it receives information about a road traffic collision. Officers illuminate blue lights and make their way to the collision scene. There was no police vehicle in Snowdon Road at the time of the collision and we believe there were no other vehicles involved in the incident. We have based this on witness accounts, tracking data and CCTV. All those times and all those locations, it sounds like it was a detailed report that was just given there. But there was a key bit of information that wasn't included. And that's the Deputy Chief Constable doesn't say when the police van stopped following the boys. It's a very relevant piece of information. We weren't told. I'm a journalist at the press conference, picked up on that. What was the last point at which the police were actively uh, following it? Listening to your time codes there, if I uh, got them correctly, it, it seems to be just a few seconds before the fatal uh, collision. That, of course, contradicts what we initially thought, that there was no police chase. So what was the cause for the chase, and at what point did you stop chasing them? I want to be as transparent and open as I can with the communities of Ely so that they understand what has happened. I've set out the timeline based on the factual information that we have. But the IOPC are conducting an independent investigation regarding whether any pursuit has taken place. So I can't fully answer your question today, and for that I apologise. It's 
Sounds like quite a contradictory statement. I'm here to be as clear as possible and to make clear what happened, but I can't tell you what what happened. She's saying it's for the IOPC to decide whether a chase even took place. Was there a pursuit? Um, which seems, you know, I think most people now sort of look at the images we've seen and it seems that there was some kind of pursuit. It wasn't just by chance that uh, this van was following these people. Also relevant, we've looked at a map of Ely and everything Bacon says is consistent with the boys using an alley between Stanway Road and Stoden Road to escape the police. Now that also seemed to be suggested by a BBC journalist at the press conference. So as you can see, it's just seen uh, footage of the last half an hour, but it's a time coming from 18 and 1. It's from Stanway Road. It shows two boys on their bike coming up from Archer Road following the police. Now, this seems to contradict your timeline, because it seems as though the only reason they couldn't get on to the road when the crash happened was at all hours at the end. I've been really clear that I've given you factual and accurate information to the apps. Would you let me finish? Thank you. Absolutely, to the best of my knowledge at this moment in time. So factual information, this is what's interesting. Factual information can be misleading, right? So uh, the information we initially got from the police was was false. I think everyone accepts now. They said there wasn't any chase. Um, there wasn't any chase of the boys. Now they say there was a situation, there's just false rumours before, and there was a situation where the van had been following the boys, but at the time of the crash, they were half a mile away. Now, obviously, you hear that of its own accord. Oh, at the time of the crash, they were half a mile away. That means the chase or pursuit, if it did happen, must have ended, right? Um, but uh, this information seems to suggest maybe that's not what happened. Rather, it could have been just the result of the police van having to, or the fact that it was, you know, a way away from the boys could have just been the result of the police van having to have made a a detour, right? So there was an alley, the boys went down it on the bike, the police van obviously can't go down an alley, so they make a detour, right? If that's the case, the claim the boys were not being pursued when they died, which has been the fallback position of the police, so we were following them, but at the time at which they were in the traffic accident and and, and died, the, the police were, were half a mile away, which is to say the police had nothing to do with it. Now, I, obviously, I, I, we don't know what happened. But if the only reason the police van was in a different place to the boys was that they went down an alley which the police van couldn't go down, then it seems very questionable to say that they weren't being pursued at that point in time, right? Because in, in a chase, and we've all seen them in, in, in movies. Now, again, the police are still not even admitting this was a chase. Um, we haven't got enough footage to really determine exactly what happened. But in, in, in movies where you see a car chase, right? It's not always the case that the police car is right next to the thing it's chasing because the person they're chasing could go down an alley. The police van will have to sort of make a detour and work out how they can best um, re-find the people who they are pursuing. So, you know, from that perspective, the chase is still going on, right? Again, we don't know this. We don't know this. But it does seem to me that the information they're telling us seems to be very selectively chosen. And it, it, it's moving closer and closer to a situation whereby it seems like actually the, the, the initial reports we got, the false rumours that these boys died while they were being pursued by police. You know, it's, as I say, we don't have all the information in front of us, but it seems what we, the information we do have in front of us seems very consistent with that supposedly false rumour just being the truth. The point of this press conference was for them to say, look, yeah, obviously communication hasn't been ideal so far. You know, we, we, we have made some statements that then turned out not to be true, but we're, we're going to be very clear with you here. We're going to be very clear about what happened. I'm none the wiser after that press conference. Well, isn't it funny that when it comes to their behavior being scrutinized, we have to comb through facts and we have to be so careful about what we put out there. But in the immediate aftermath of the death of these two precious boys, they were so quick to immediately jump to telling us exactly what happened and to say categorically that there was no chase happening when they died. So it's funny how they kind of weaponize this idea of rigor and carefulness and transparency and facts when ultimately their asses have been shown. But when it comes to their first response, the first thing that they're going to give to the media, they have no problem being fast and loose with the fact and trying to portray a particular reality, a particular framing as being the reality when truly they actually have no objective facts in order to, sub to, to back that up. And this is what we see time and time again. You know, we've seen it with Jean-Charles de Menezes. We saw it with Mark Duggan. And now we've seen it um, with Kyrie and Harvey. The absolute, it, 
it doesn't even they don't even think twice before lying um, when they have caused the death of someone, a precious person in our community. So the, it, it's the for me, it's just it's the almost pathological lie and the confidence with which they lie, the confidence that they will be believed and reported upon uncritically by the media, that the media will essentially reprint Met, Met Police or general police um, press releases. What is different now uh, and what makes this difficult or, or trickier for the police is the availability of CCTV footage and camera phone footage, which essentially can provide concrete, because most of the time when this happens, there isn't a CCTV camera. There isn't someone filming on their smartphone. It happens in the dark of night and we never find out what really happened and the police are always believed. But when you have these instances of footage emerging that directly contradicts what the police have said, it then creates obviously this really difficult situation. But for me, for the police that is, but for me, the question is, we now have ample evidence, you know, since the, the physical assault of Rodney King, you know, and I know that that happened in the US and not in the UK, but it's a similar kind of dynamic. Since the brutal beating of Rodney King, which was captured on film in 1991, we have had video evidence of the police either lying about what they've done, um, but also being ridiculously violent to members of the community and then lying about that violence. So we have the footage, right? We have so much footage. We can see it with our own eyes. And yet that isn't translating into change. And for me, that gap between, you would have thought that once people got to see what was happening and once you saw this evidence, you know, with your own eyes, that things would have to change. And yet things haven't. And, you know, it's been, what, 30 years now that we have been seeing, that we haven't just had to rely on the word of the police, but we've had all this footage, of course, on top of what people, particularly black and, black and brown people, have been saying about the police all along. So for me, that question really is, why does that not translate into change? And that's something that I actually, beyond saying that this is the systemic function of the police, is to brutalize working class people, beyond that, I'm not really sure what the answer is. I'm not sure if you sort of implied that we know the police caused these deaths in Ely. I, I don't think we do know that yet. Um, but I think what we can see is that the behaviour they have, you know, undertaken since that tragic event has, you know, it does not seem like they've been honest with the public. And it's a, an issue where they genuinely have to be honest. And it, it, it's it's less than not being honest because they, they ultimately sort of said, oh, all of these people are just, you know, believing any old rumour from social media. And now it turns out that the rumor from social media seems much closer to the truth than what they had been out on the BBC sort of saying to everyone. And in terms of that, why haven't people learned? I mean, I know we have different views on the police, Dahlia, but I think an obvious takeaway that I'm sure we can all agree on is why haven't journalists learned to be more questioning of police statements? It, it, it seems that we still have this situation where journalists say, oh, well, the, the Metropolitan Police said this. Well, obviously, this was the Metropolitan Police, but the police force say this. Um, that's... Uh, an official source of authority and therefore we're going to repeat that fairly uncritically even though time after time after time after time especially the first comment which we get from the police just completely crumbles and as you say Dahlia that's because of the preponderance of, of things such as CCTV in this situation you do have to wonder if there hadn't been some CT CCTV showing a van chasing these kids on bikes would we still just be believing oh it was just kids imagining stuff when they said they saw these kids being chased by, by a van so yeah, I mean, it, it's, there are many conclusions you can draw from this, but I think one is don't trust the police. <laughs> don't trust the police. Don't trust them uncritically. And too many people in the media do. The Equality and Human Rights Commission, or EHRC, is the public body tasked with upholding the Equalities Act. It's supposed to be independent of government and it's supposed to protect people from discrimination. But now its chair, Kishwa Faulkner, is herself the subject of an independent investigation. That's after 40 complaints of bullying, discrimination and transphobia were made by EHRC staff. In February of this year, senior staff wrote a document outlining, quote, governance concerns seen by Channel 4 News. The document says this. We are deeply concerned about an increase in bullying, harassment and discrimination, which is not in line with who we are as an organisation. There is a lack of psychological safety, i.e. the fear of who will be attacked next. Unacceptable behavior from the chairwoman is becoming normalized. Staff are not treated with dignity and respect. Discriminatory comments 
Discussions have been openly had with officers present, e.g. November board meeting on the Equality Act. So what were those discriminatory comments made at the November meeting? Well, it took place a day after this woman, Emma Laslett, appeared on the final of Radio 4's Brain of Britain. That show was billed as having an all-woman lineup, and Laslett happens to be trans. Attending the EHRC meeting the next day were 22 commissioners, as well as a representative from the government's equality hub. That's when Faulkner is alleged to have called Laslett, quote, a bloke in lipstick. According to Channel 4, she was rebuked by the EHRC's chief executive. In a report on the case, Channel 4 put Faulkner's alleged comments to Laslett. I mean, if that's true, it's, I mean, on the one hand, not the worst comment I've received, but on the other, it's disgusting and just disheartening. If your job is to protect people by, from discrimination and while on duty and in front of everybody else who's doing that, you are peddling that kind of discrimination, th then, then you're not fit for the job and honestly shouldn't be doing it anymore. It's not the first time Faulkner's been in the spotlight for having her own agenda. In April, she wrote a letter to The Times backing a plan by Equalities Minister Kemi Badenoch to rewrite the Equalities Act to define sex as biological sex. And according to Channel 4, Faulkner wrote that letter despite legal advice given to the EHRC saying there was no need to change the law. Also in April, Vice News reported that seven senior officials in the AHRC had quit over transphobia. That was after another Vice article from February last year reported how staff members were quitting the organisation over a takeover by, quote, an anti-LGBT culture. According to Channel 4, 25% of EHRC staff quit last year. And when you look at LGBT staff, that number jumps to 40%. Faulkner's behaviour has long led to questions over how independent from government the organisation actually is, which makes sense. Its commissioners and chair are always appointed by the then government, right? So I, I think it's, we shouldn't really be calling any of these organisations independent. And Faulkner herself was appointed by then Equalities Minister Liz Truss, who would go on to make rolling back trans rights a pledge in her successful leadership campaign. Um, a year after Faulkner took the reins, her predecessor himself, a Tory, so appointed um, by a Tory um, government minister as well, um, he complained that EHRC had become a political tool. And that was echoed by another anonymous former commissioner interviewed by Channel 4. I think the AHRC was being used by government ministers to help them achieve their political interests around some of these culture war issues. And I think that's incredibly dangerous because the AHRC is supposed to be the independent watchdog on equality and human rights. And the sad, heartbreaking thing about that is that the most vulnerable people, such as trans people, end up being on the front line of that game. And their lives are made worse. And they end up being worried and scared about what's going on. In a statement to Channel 4 News, Faulkner said this, I have worked my whole life to promote the principles of equality and human rights, which are close to my heart as a British Pakistani woman in public life. It was considered appropriate to investigate the allegations through an independent investigator. While the process continues, all I can do is explain that allegations were received in February in my capacity as chair of the commission. They relate to both me and the whole board. I, of course, take these allegations very seriously and with humility. I will be cooperating fully with the investigation and have every confidence in being exonerated. Um, that apologetic tone, though, was completely absent from an article in today's Telegraph, which is based entirely on comments from Faulkner's allies in the EHRC. This was its headline, Baroness Faulkner determined to fight attempted coup by young liberal civil servants. Um, and then the subtitle, The Woman at the Centre of Internal Complaints at Equalities Watchdog is preparing a robust defence. Dahlia, what do you make of what's going on in the EHRC? Well, I think you're completely right to point out the systemic reasons why something like the EHRC not only can't be independent from government, because obviously its chairs are always politically appointed. So there's always going to be boundaries within which the EHRC can operate. But also, I would argue, actually cannot really meaningfully engage with liberation politics. You know, this is a state adjacent body that is always going to be 
pretty conser- inherently conservative because it's not going to, even though it's meant to advise the government, it's appointed by the government to advise the government. So it's always going to operate within very limited conservative boundaries. And this has always been the case. You know, Trevor Phillips was the longest serving, I think he was the chair of the HRC when the HRC was established in 2007 and was remained the um, chair of the EHRC for a really long time. That is an incredibly conservative person, particularly within the context of anti-discrimination politics within in Britain, you know, and anti-racism politics in Britain. Trevor Phillips is about as conservative as you can get. So the EHRC, in a sense, has always been about kind of blunting the imagination and blunting the tools of an anti-oppression politics, trying to kind of absorb it and, and contain it and defang it, essentially. But even within that structural context, um, you know, the appointment of Faulkner was deeply politicized, even, even acknowledging that broader systemic issue. Uh, she was appointed by Liz Truss as part of Liz Truss's so-called war on woke, i.e. war on anyone that happens to be marginalized, any marginalized community that they can get their hands on. Um, and precisely, in all, it was in part of this, this caricature of the EHRC being run by, you know, soft, bleeding heart liberals, which I guess if what you want to do is enter part of the civil service that is based in anti-discrimination, you're probably going to be a bleeding heart liberal, right? But in an attempt to kind of stir up and as part of this broader politics of war on woke, this was the context in which Liz Truss hired Faulkner, appointed Faulkner. So Faulkner wasn't appointed to this anti-discrimination body despite her transphobia. She was appointed to this body because of her transphobia. It was precisely, it, the, the reason she was put there was to kick up issues that, by the way, were settled, you know, gender recognition certificates, the idea that, you know, biological sex and gender or whatever are not conflated, all of these things. That was a settled issue. And what Faulkner did on the, on the, as part of her, her raison d'etre, as given by Liz Truss, was to kick that up and make it into an issue. And this is part of the Conservatives' overall approach, which is essentially to say, OK, well, we can't disband the EHRC. We can't ban the EHRC. So what we'll do is we'll just weaponize it, you know? Um, and that is why we are seeing um, what seems like a contradiction, which is someone who is, holds incredibly bigoted views uh, being not only appointed to an equality and anti-discrimination body, but actually using her position in order to further discrimination against a vulnerable community. But that's actually what she was always put there to do. And that's why anti-oppression politics is never going to be, happen in a state adjacent institution. It's always going to happen in the streets, in the grassroots. Um, and we should be trying to reclaim power from these institutions rather than seeing them as having anything to do with our movements and our liberation. I'm going to make a similar point about the EHRC to what I made about the police, which is you've got these bodies which are clearly, you know, there's some pros and some cons to having them, right? But clearly they should not be taken as these infallible institutions, very much far from it. And I think what's very frustrating in journalism and politics in this country is when it suits people, they will say, ah, well, the police said this, therefore it's true. The EHRC said this, therefore it's true. We saw that with the police when it came to what's been happening in Wales. Um, we saw that um, with the EHRC when it came to the Labour Party. So it's like, how dare you question a single sentence in the EHRC report on Labour anti-Semitism? Well, how dare I? Because it's a very political organisation. That doesn't mean I have to throw out any report it makes out of hand. But you can't read it like this was written from God or the gods of equality law. Because they, they are, there are no gods of equality law, right? These are people who are selected by politicians to run what I think has been run as for a very long time, a very political organization, right? So, and maybe that's fine. Maybe it's fine to have a relatively political organization close to government write reports about equalities law, but you can't then take it as God given that it's correct, right? Because if, if it's political, then therefore we're well within our rights to disagree with stuff that it has said. And I think people are, you know, very understandably disagreeing with the current position of the EHRC on trans rights. Um, I think I disagree with the EHRC on, on the extent of, of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party compared to racism in other organisations and other parties, right? So it, it seems to me we have to get a bit real with all of these things. People, people seem to get dazzled by the notion of, of authority, independence, when 
lots of these organizations are full of quite a lot of self-serving people who have an agenda. Some good people, some bad people, um, but none of it should just be taken as a given. Oh, yeah, the HRC, so that's, uh, therefore it's true. But so many journalists do that, so long as it aligns with the interests of their faction, of their allies. Navarro Live viewers, I have smeared a man. It happened on last week's show when we were talking about the row over seasonal workers and immigration. This is what I said. Guy Singh Watson is founder of Riverford Organic Vegetable Company. He told The Guardian this. The reality of the conditions of many of those who work in the fields picking our food is pretty abhorrent. I really don't like the dependence on foreign workers who are inevitably treated badly. But in reality, to get the fruit and vegetables picked over the next few years, we do need more people coming from abroad to save the industry we have left. Interesting, he says foreign workers will inevitably be treated badly. That's someone who is high up in one of these companies. Maybe he could not treat them badly, I don't know. Uh, maybe the economics doesn't allow it. I assume that's what he'd probably argue. Now, what made me reassess that comment was an email from a Navara Live viewer. They wrote to us on Monday's show, Michael Walker quoted from Riverford CEO Guy Singh Watson talking about foreign workers who are inevitably treated badly. Michael Walker then suggested that maybe Guy Singh Watson could not treat them badly. I kind of assume that Geising Watson wasn't referring to their own practices at Riverford, but rather other companies because Riverford seemed to be one of the good guys. I haven't really scrutinized this myself, but they do talk a pretty good game about employee rights and will often lament other people's or others' work practices within the farming industry. I think they are even making moves towards a cooperative model. So that email made me feel kind of bad. You know, maybe I jumped to conclusions. Then um, a couple of days later, a story came out in The Guardian that made me feel really bad. So you can see this here, veg box firm Riverford to be 100% staff owned as founder sells stake for 10 million pounds. And it says exclusive. Guy Singh Watson says he will continue to be involved in the business and will pay full tax on dividends. So we've, we've got a guy who treats his work as well and now um, his company is becoming a worker owned company. So maybe I got it wrong. Maybe I jumped to conclusions. And earlier today, I spoke to Guy Singh Watson to apologize. Michael, you don't need to apologise. I, uh, I don't think I express myself very well. I mean, it's not inevitable that people will be exploited. It's just that they normally are. I mean, that just seems to be the way it works out. I don't think um, the very few non-UK nationals we have working at Riverford are exploited, but on most farms they are. You know, from your perspective as someone who runs a farm, I mean, how does this immigration debate play into your industry are you someone who is reliant on foreign workers to to pick fruit and food or because you're i mean it, i suppose you're a bit of a premium product aren't you riverford i guess that's true and some of that premium does go into you know, paying people better you know trying to make the world a bit more like the world so many of us want to live in so that's treating people respectfully being sensible use of packaging you know, not air freighting stuff around the world and so on. But but that, you know, does often end up being a bit more expensive. And indeed, some of that money we do use to make sure that we pay people properly. So everyone's paid the voluntary living wage and they get a profit share on top of that. So it came out today, 19% is the level of food inflation. And we talk about it a lot on this show, but we don't often talk to farmers um, about food inflation. So from your perspective, why are we seeing this right now? There's sort of varying explanations sort of going around. One is sort of people um, trying to profit maximize and, and sort of relying or exploiting, let's say, the situation to try and increase their profits. The other is that it's all input costs potentially from, from the Ukraine war and, and climate difficulties elsewhere. And then there's also the labor issue. Was it something to do with Brexit? I mean, are your prices going up by 19%? If so, why? No, we they're going up by, I think, I think I'm right in saying 5% next month. And they did go up by 5% last autumn. Uh, so that's 10%. And I don't think it was over a year before we had a price increase in that. So we're not running at anything like that. And I think part of the reason is that a much higher proportion of the pound that people spend with Riverfords goes back to the grower. And those growers' costs have risen. I mean, labour has gone up in the last two years by 20%. Obviously, energy price, prices have gone up hugely. And you just can't expect to continue squeezing growers and expect them to absorb those costs. So prices must rise, um, you know, and it's not as if they were making much money before that. So, you know, yeah, I think it is inevitable that prices will rise, though it may seem that, you know, there's talk about inflation maybe coming down, but growers haven't had those prices increase over the last two years where they've suffered the effect of that inflation. So, yeah, I mean, I'm afraid you just can't squeeze 
anymore. I mean, as you'll see, you know, farmers are just not restocking their flocks, whether they're laying old poultry birds, because they can't even pay for the cost of food and labour, let alone the fixed costs associated with maintaining the house and running uh, the uh, chicken house and running their business. So you just can't, you know, it just can't be squeezed anymore, however inconvenient that may be to our current government and their proclamations about bringing inflation down. And I also wanted to talk to you about uh, another story last week, which is that you're selling your company to the workers. So the, the people that work at Riverford are going to become the owners. Um, can you talk about that process? What, what, does that, what does that mean? How should we understand what's going on here? Well, it started about 20 years ago. I've been thinking about it. And that five years ago, I sold 76, sorry, 74% of the business to the now co-owners, then staff um, for about a quarter of what the accountants told me it was worth. And then five years later, uh, I've decided to sell the remaining um, uh, 26%. Well, actually, it's 23% now. Um, I'll continue working in the business um, as a, but you know, like a co-owner, as a co-owner like everyone else. This last tranche of, of shares, let's say, that you've sold, um, I think has gone for £10 million. Now, is that is that the market rate that you've sold it to the workers or is there, was that reduced to some degree as some sort of gesture in favour of worker ownership? Yeah, no, the, the last 23% are being sold more or less at the market rate, which has turned out to be, you know, hugely more than I had ever anticipated. Uh, the first 76, 74% were sold at about a quarter of the market rate because I didn't want to... Uh, lumber the business with a lot of debt that would put it under stress and and threaten the values that we've always held dear but i mean we have got the money in the bank and i i decided to take market value for the last 23 percent and of that money i uh, i intend to pay my full rate of tax um so that will reduce it quite substantially and then most of the remainder is going into various um social and environmental projects, um, you know, which I'll probably spend the rest of my life administering. What does worker ownership mean in this context? I mean, there are sort of different different types of worker ownership, aren't there? So John Lewis is, is, is worker owned, we're told. It's not a worker co-op, of course, and you'll see elsewhere you get worker cooperatives. What will it mean for Riverford that it's worker owned? Riverford is quite similar to the John Lewis uh, partnership. I do have some reservations about their model. I think it's a bit cumbersome a bit clunky in the decision-making, and I wanted Riverford to stay, I don't know, a bit more willing to take risks and maybe even occasionally offend people and be an outlier. So, we, you know, we do have a slightly more light of foot um, system of governance, but broadly it's very similar to the John Lewis in that the shares are held in trust for the benefit of the, of the co-owners, the people who are working in the business at that time. Um, and... You know, I think it's a really good model. It gives the the co-owners, um, well, obviously gives them a share in the profits. The only money that will leave the business will be to them, um, other than investment. Uh, and uh, but you know, perhaps even more importantly, it gives them, you know, a degree of agency over their lives. They do ultimately determine the direction that the business goes in. And if they don't like the way it's been run by me and the other directors, um, they can sack us. So basically, there's an investor's AGM and uh, the people who have shares in it or the partners who are the workers, they could sort of say, we don't like the direction of this. We want to hire new directors and fire the current ones. Is that sort of how that mechanism would work? Not really, no. I mean, it's uh, it's all on our website if anyone wants to have a look. But it, there's a, an elected co-owner council and they each have their constituencies and, and they advise the board on certain decision making. So, for instance, they control pay, they control my pay and, and the, uh, the uh, director, other directors pay, everyone's pay. Um, and from that council is elected um, a board of trustees who have the ability to question the board and indeed, if they don't like what's going on, to um, dismiss them. My thanks to Guy Singh Watson for not holding a grudge um, and for the Navarra viewer that emailed in, who was also called Guy, a coincidence. Um, if you if you feel like I've ever misrepresented anyone on a Navarra live show, please do um, get in touch. Um, I, I, I'm always interested in, in your thoughts, so email. I presume it's info at navarramedia.com. 45-year-old Brian Johnson has a pretty common wish. He'd like to be 18 again. But as a California tech millionaire, he unusually has the means to try and make it a reality. 
I have said publicly that I'm trying to become 18 years old. It's kind of a joke because my boys are 19 and 17. So I split the difference and I tell them on a regular basis, I want to beat them at everything which they love. And so every time I'm doing something new with Blueprint, I will measure them and then I will measure myself. So whether it be the amount of fat in their face, their athletic ability, their VO2 max, which is how much oxygen they can work with in their body or any other metric, I measure them, I measure myself, and then I'm trying to become like them because I like to say, when I grow younger, I want to be like you. Now, it's one thing trying to regain your lost youth. It's another thing using your own teenage sons as your benchmark, measuring and scanning their bodies for comparison with your own. That's pretty weird, but if only that was as weird as it gets, Johnson has called his quest to regain his lost youth project blueprint. It's aimed to reverse quantifiably the age of 70 of his own organs. Now, when I first read this, I was surprised we have 70 organs, but we, we do have at least 70, apparently. Johnson spends $2 million a year to, according to a Bloomberg article, quote, gain the brain, heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, tendons, teeth, skin, hair, bladder, penis, and rectum of an 18-year-old. Very specific, in any case. Some of his methods are pretty conventional, though taken to extreme lengths. These are the pills I take on waking. And I take this with the Green Giant. It's about 10 ounces of fluid. I have about four to five ounces left after taking the pills. But a few things in here, like garlic and uh, CA, AKG, alpha, ketoglutarate. I take NR, uh, CoQ10, uh, ferritin, vitamin D, yeah, blueberry, chocolate flavanols, turmeric. So that's normal. That's just a rich guy eating well. Um, other things, though, are a little disturbing. A Times journalist recently um, followed him and his 17-year-old son, Talmadge, to a Dallas clinic um, where they underwent a very specific procedure. The paper reports this. At an airline check-in desk in California, the software entrepreneur Brian Johnson turned to his teenage son, Talmadge, and asked a few pointed questions. Do I want your plasma, he said. How has your plasma been? What's the warning label here? Johnson and his son were on their way to a clinic in Texas where Talmadge would serve as his blood boy, donating plasma that would be injected into his father's bloodstream as part of a drive to demonstrate how a middle-aged man might once again possess the body of an 18-year-old. So his, his son is his blood boy. Um, very bizarre. We'll leave that there. And um, the article goes on to say this. It was the latest in a string of plasma infusions Johnson had received at the clinic in Dallas, usually from young anonymous donors who had been screened to check that they were healthy and free of diseases. This time, his father, Richard Johnson, 70, would take part as well, receiving some of Johnson's plasma in a tri-generational transfer that was billed as the first in history. It's not surprising that's the first time that's happened in history. Um, the treatment is inspired partly by an experiment in which old and juvenile mice were stitched together, so it could be worse, um, to share the same circulatory system. The older rodents showed improvements, but there is as yet little evidence to support the efficacy of plasma transfusions for humans. So I suppose, you know, donating blood to your parent is much better than getting stitched um, to them. Um, how did the procedure go? The article concludes with this. At the Resurgent Wellness Clinic in Dallas, clinicians drew a liter of blood from Johnson, his father, and his son. I created this human, Johnson said proudly, as his son's blood was drawn. He is now almost 18 years old. We are now doing this together. I never imagined in my entire life this kind of relationship with my child. He added, thanks for the plasma. No worries, his son replied. Dahlia, a tear is coming to my eye. You know, it's kind of nice, you know, the kid, everyone wants their parents to be happy. Give them some blood if it keeps them young. I'm, I'm actually not as judgmental about this story as some people have been on social media. What do you think? Men will literally inject themselves with their son's plasma instead of going to therapy. Like... <laughs> Something is seriously wrong. Like my abiding motto when it comes to all of these kinds of stories that come out of Silicon Valley is just because you can doesn't mean you should. And like, I know that sounds like a joke, but genuinely, what does it say about how broken our way of thinking is and how broken our economy is that one man in California can spend two million a year trying to reverse age and trying to become 18 again. And yet in the vast majority of the world, you have these incredibly like racialized and geographic 
get like distances in terms of, you know, um, life expectancy, gaps in life expectancy. You know, in, in Britain here, there is a 12 year difference in the life expectancy of someone born in Glasgow versus someone born in Hampstead. Like it feels like it would be a better use of our technological resources, of our financial resources, of our labor, of, you know, media coverage to figure out a way to address that rather than trying to make some man live forever in California. So for me, it's just like, honestly, an indictment of how we decide and who we allow to decide how our resources and technological expertise, what it's actually put towards. Because fundamentally, no one asked for this man to live forever. So I don't know why, where he gets the nerve to think that that's what we should all care about. So I'm going to put to you the, the, the opposite view, as I often like to do. Um, so, I mean, this guy's not a comrade, right? This guy's not a socialist. Um, I, I, I don't think I would probably be his friend. But um, the argument that this is not a terrible way for the super... I don't want there to be super rich people also, by the way, but, but, but there are super rich people. And them using their money to do experimental things to try and reverse the course of aging... I mean, it's one of the uses of their money that could possibly have the best externalities, right? So if, if they just spend their money on luxury cars, I mean, maybe if they're electric cars, you can make a similar argument. But if, if you want rich people when they spend money to spend money on stuff where if these technologies develop and become successful, the price might reduce and then we could all benefit from them. So if you've got a bunch of funky rich guys in Silicon Valley who are putting millions towards reversing aging, and then they discover some new technology or some new mechanism by which we can all get younger for kind of you know, and it doesn't have this extortionate price tag. That would be a good thing, right? I mean, I hated being a teenager, so I have no interest in becoming yeah, a teenager. You'd have the mental, you'd have the mental clarity <laughs> of a of a grown up adult with the with the sort of fresh body of a younger person. You know, you'd, 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 be, know. you'd be I'm fit. You wouldn't have an achy back. <laughs> yeah, but you're but quite I'm young, not. Dahlia. <laughs> my hair, but my hairline's already going back. <laughs> but the, this is a this is a good. Point. And what I would say to that is we have the technology and medical capability to actually do a lot better than we are currently doing when it comes to healthcare outcomes. Like fundamentally, we don't even we don't actually need to advance to go to the technology to take the technology to this extreme because ultimately we have the technological expertise to, you know, make sure that everyone who's diabetic has like free access to insulin. We have the technological expertise to manage a huge range of conditions that people are still really underserved in and to support people's, not just, you know, to, to help prevent people from getting sick, but also to improve their overall wellness. To You know, we know that stress is one of the biggest things that can attack your body when it comes to your mental and your physical health. We have the, the understanding in many ways to on how to improve those health outcomes for people. And yet people don't get access to that technology because it's the very people like this man from Silicon Valley and, you know, like the super wealthy and the people who are invested in like medical technology in, in Silicon Valley. Those are the very same people who are doing everything they can to ensure that those technologies remain patented and, you know, gatekept so that people can't access them. You know, insulin is a very rudimentary technology, and yet not everyone has access to it. So really, for me, I'm like, let's sort out, I, I know what you mean by externalities and whatever, but ultimately, it's a net loss, because the very existence of people like this is all about patenting and safe and gatekeeping the even rudimentary medical technologies from the people who need them most, you know? Ooh, we could talk about this for hours. I want to end with a very cutting comment, actually, from Valerie Camru in the comments. Um, so my, my pitch for this was that you could have, you know, the brains of your, you know, mature selves with, with, with younger bodies, less achy. Um, Valerie Camru says, sounds more like an old body with the brain of an adolescent. Um, talking about this guy who is trying to reverse aging using all of his millions of pounds. He's saying he doesn't, he doesn't look like an adolescent, but he potentially does still think like one. Um, Dahlia. Uh, thank you so much for joining me this evening. We've had, there's been some real range today. Yeah, I saw you eat a big slice of humble pie that you hopefully made with Riverford veggies and fruit. <laughs>
I thought we were going down a blood route. <laughs> so I thought if I was watching, it, it's like I did it. I haven't, I haven't done any of these things, Tommy. I haven't just been sitting here sucking on a cup of blood while you were listening to the farmer. Uh, <laughs> right. Let's wrap up there. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Come back tomorrow at 6 p.m. for another live stream. You've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.